It's the 17th of September and you're listening to Kobe Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Bey, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 29th episode. You'd think that the once-in-a-century coronavirus pandemic will put on hold most matters of politics and statecraft, but you'd be wrong. Here in our neighborhood, Malaysia and Thailand keep producing regular headlines with respect to power struggle and protests. China-India border friction has reached levels not seen in decades. And in the U.S., of course, events around forthcoming elections are in full swing. Then there is the U.K. and Brexit. Remember that? A process that began with a referendum in 2016 continues through many ups and downs, with the U.K. on its third prime minister since then. It has caused uncertainties around the pound and the U.K. real estate market, both matters of particular interest to investors in Asia. It has also brought into question the future of EU, the usefulness of multilateral pacts governing trade and commerce, and perhaps most profoundly, the role of the UK in the global landscape. All of this had been dormant for a while as the UK dealt with the coronavirus pandemic, which by no means is over. But things have taken a dramatic turn lately with UK's plans to introduce legislation that would override the withdrawal agreement with the EU. This issue can become challenging to understand, so today we will talk to a foremost expert on this. We are lucky to have with us Sir Ivan Rogers, former permanent representative of the UK to the EU between 2013 and 2017. Sir Ivan spent most of his career as a civil servant in the UK Treasury, where his positions included private secretary to Kenneth Clark, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Director of Budget and Public Finances under Gordon Brown. He also spent three years as Principal Private Secretary to the Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Sir Ivan Rogers, welcome to Kopi Time. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's a great honor for us, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, during the 23rd and 24th of January this year, the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act became law. It received the backing off of the Constitutional Committee in the European Parliament, and then the agreement got signed, I think, the following day uh, by all yes. parties concerned. Eight months have gone by, and we have sort of forgotten about it here in Asia, but it seems like it's by no means over. We have drama, and a couple of days ago, I saw U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi warning that there would be no chance of a U.S.-U.K. trade deal if the U.K. were to undermine the Brexit agreement with EU. Uh, She said, and I quote, whatever form it takes, Brexit cannot be allowed to imperil the Good Friday Agreement, including the stability brought on by the invisible and frictionless, frictionless border between the Irish Republic and Northern Ireland. So, Sir Ivan, if you may, uh, maybe we start with that. If you help us break down where we stand in the Brexit process and what hurdles have propped up lately. Well, thanks very much. Yes, let me try. Um, That agreement, as you say, was uh, uh, concluded and ratified both by the UK Parliament and by the European Parliament in January. And at the end of January, we formally left the European Union with that withdrawal agreement. Uh, So we are out of the European Union, which is why it's now only got 27 member states, not 28. But all that's happened is the withdrawal agreement. Uh, That simply dealt with the terms of withdrawal, including the financial issues, citizens' rights, uh, and the Irish border question. Although, as you rightly say, that is now back in play. It didn't deal with the so-called future relationship, um, above all, of course, on our future economic relations and trade relations. Uh, or indeed our foreign policy and security relations. That was for another day. The withdrawal agreement had treaty status, has treaty status, is in force, is the law of the land. And what's happened here, that was uh, that was passed you, you, by an overwhelming vote in the House of Commons, all on conservative votes, with Boris Johnson declaring it at the time, um, a negotiating triumph for him in that he'd revised the agreement that he inherited from Theresa May, our previous prime minister, got a superior agreement, changed the uh, provisions on Northern Ireland, and he declared victory. The strange thing that's happened, I, I personally don't think it's that strange because I think candidly, um, maybe a bit cynically on my part, this was always the Johnson intention. The strange thing that's happened is he's now, having declared this a glorious victory eight months ago, now decided that on closer examination of the withdrawal agreement as it stands, and the European Union's interpretation of what's in the withdrawal agreement, um, it's a mortal threat to the integrity of the United Kingdom and that the European side is trying to divide the United Kingdom and um, hive off Northern Ireland. 
Now, this withdrawal agreement that he's facing is exactly, as I say, the withdrawal agreement that uh, he declared a, a massive negotiating triumph eight months ago. Nothing has changed. And the provisions which the current government does not like in that withdrawal agreement were visible to them 12 months ago. Indeed, people like me outside the system were talking about them 12 months ago before the UK general election. So what's going on here? Um, look, we on the future relationship, we were always going to reach um, a very difficult point in uh, Q3 and Q4 of this year as to whether any agreement could be struck between the EU and the UK. Uh, and this was never going to be straightforward. Um, I'm a bit notorious in this country, or I, I had my 15 minutes of fame in this country in 2016 when I uh, resigned from uh, the system in the, at the Christmas of that year, when I was on record as having said that I thought the future relationship uh, negotiations would be extremely difficult. Bear in mind, lots of Brexiteer, Eurosceptic politicians were saying it was the easiest trade deal in history. I was saying it was going to be immensely difficult uh, to do and would take a very long time. And before the relationship settled down, it might take as long as a decade from 2016. Well, here we are nearly four and a half years later, and we're still in the throes of the final negotiations to achieve a very skinny uh, free trade agreement, if that's what we can get. Why is it so difficult? Stand back a bit before we get into the details of what's going on, because we're leaving uh, the European Union and all its political and juridical uh, structures, which are extremely complex. The European Union is a very deep integration project that goes well beyond uh, pure free trade and, ec and the economic domain. It's both a single market which I would describe really as a regulatory union. It's all about the kind of harmonization of regulations across what were the 28 member states. We used to be fervently in favor of the single market from Margaret Thatcher onwards, and the single market only came into effect in 1992. Um, uh, but we're leaving the single market. We're also leaving the customs union. Why are we leaving the customs union? Because a customs union entails having a common external trade policy. And Brexiteer Eurosceptic politicians didn't want to be part of Europe's external trade policy. They wanted to have their own free trade policy and strike their own free trade deals. But as soon as you leave both a single market and a customs union, that's an extremely complex endeavor. No country has ever deliberately left a deep integrated trade bloc before. And it's not easy to do. And the idea that it can be done in, you know, 10 minutes, as some Eurosceptic politicians were telling me four years ago, it can't because you're leaving one extraordinarily complex and deep legal framework because you can no longer accept the implications of that for UK sovereignty and control over its own affairs. Um, and you're moving inevitably into a different legal framework, but all of that legal framework on everything from food and drink to chemicals and pharmaceuticals to financial services to uh, cars uh, to energy to aviation, all of it has to be negotiated and it has to take a legal form. Uh, and the question is both what legal form and then what degree of market access we get inside the European market on what terms. And what essentially are we prepared to take by way of obligations or payments in order to achieve that level of market access? Uh, so um, I hope that sort of explains the background. We're now reaching the crunch point of, is there a deal doable at all to achieve even a very skinny free trade agreement? Or will the whole thing now collapse because uh, the two sides have radically different conceptions of what uh, the end game should be and what the landing zone for a deal should be. Um, so let me stop there, but um, I hope that gives you a sort of bit of context for why this is exceptionally difficult and why we're now reaching the absolute crunch point as to whether there will actually be a deal between the EU and the UK or whether these negotiations collapse acrimoniously in the next four to six weeks. Yeah, no, it's absolutely super helpful. Um, I suppose in my reading of the drama of the last few days, at least reading the big editorial that the FT published a few days ago, that they seem to be alluding that it is some degree of gamesmanship is involved from the Johnson administration and that the narrow issue is state subsidy on not necessarily trade in goods, but trade in services. Is it really that narrow and not particularly substantive or there are like bigger friction and fissures in place? 
I think that's exactly right that that is the biggest single issue. Um, that may sound narrow and abstruse and a bit technical. It is in a way quite central and it doesn't surprise me that it's become uh, the sticking point and maybe the stumbling block for a deal. So let me try and explain what this state aids issue is about. The UK obviously, as I say, is leaving the single market in the customs union. The single market is not just a regulatory union, though it's a deep regulatory union. It has all kinds of accompanying policies where if you're a single market member, you have to abide by them. One of those policies, which the UK always used to be very keen on, is uh, the state aids control system within the European Union, uh, which uh, you know permits or, or prohibits specific types of state aid, whether that's, you know, tax taxation relief or loans or direct financial subsidies to companies, either companies in distress or companies which are startups or companies which uh, want to invest in research and development and need government assistance. And so there's a very complex uh, framework um, within the European Union, which you have to abide by uh, if you're a member state. Now, as I say, we're leaving. The original European Union position in its negotiating mandate for these negotiations had an unreasonable demand, really, of the UK, which was called in the jargon of Brussels, and Brussels is a jargon invested town, <laughs> um, dynamic alignment. What does dynamic alignment mean? It means if you leave our system, you have to remain aligned with it from outside. And when we update our rule book on state aids, you have to update your rule book in line with it. Well, candidly, I don't think any UK government was ever going to put up with a provision which said, even after you've left the European Union, you must essentially obey our rule book and update your rule book whenever we choose to update us. So no government was ever going to agree that. And I certainly wouldn't have agreed that had I been the chief negotiator. But the UK government's got a lot further than that. The UK government has basically said, it's none of your business what our future state aids regime would be. We are now autonomous and sovereign and free. We'll go our own way. We'll have our own state aid rules, but it's none of your business in a free trade agreement. And there, I think, you know, if I'm being honest, I think the UK side is being unreasonable because the EU side is saying, are you seriously saying uh, that uh, you, know, you will have read that the chief of staff to the prime minister is talking very bold talk about the UK's desire to be, build world beating very large tech companies biotech companies, AI companies, um, uh, on a global scale. The EU is essentially saying, are you seriously saying that you want to be able to build those companies with subventions and state aids from the UK state, which would be prohibited under our rules, um, which will enable your companies to take market share and substantial market share on our market against um, for our firms, um, who are their competitors, who are unable to benefit from analogous subsidies from our governments because they're illegal under our rules. And that's essentially the issue. Is the UK government saying, as a matter of sovereignty, we are not prepared to agree anything in a free trade agreement with the European Union? Because the European Union will back off, and, or, and Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator of the European Union, has already indicated that really to David Frost, the UK's chief negotiator. It's not going to insist on dynamic alignment, which is not a credible uh, position for it to insist on. What I think it would agree and would settle for is a set of clear principles uh, respected by both sides, embedded in the free trade agreement with legal force, where if those principles were in the view of one or other partner breached by the other partner, it was open to um, the offended partner to open consultations um, and seek a dispute resolution as to whether that uh, state aid should, uh, should have been granted and is legal. And if the UK refuses that ask altogether and says, it's none of your business, we're going our own way, we don't regard this as suitable material for any free trade agreement, I genuinely think the whole set of talks will collapse on that. Now, What's different about this government, which I think it's important for your listeners to understand, this is not a classic Thatcherite, conservative, low tax, low spend government. Thatcher herself, though no enthusiast for the European Union, was quite enthusiastic about state aid rules and state aid disciplines when we were within the single market, because her fear was always actually that the French and the Germans and other continental European powers subsidised their companies much more heavily than 
she ever wanted to subsidize UK companies. But that was a low tax, low spend, deregulatory, uh, Thatcherite uh, government. This government is a not a low tax government. Not a, it may be a low regulation government, though we'll have to wait and see. Boris Johnson believes in a highly interventionist industrial policy, and his chief of staff, Dominic Cummings, who's basically the guru inside number 10, certainly believes in sustained and substantial state intervention in the economy, which includes subsidies, which he believes would not be allowed by the European Union and would be contested by the European Union if we gave them to companies um, and made this part of a free trade agreement. So as I say, this is not just some technical abstruse issue. This is absolutely the core issue of the kind of bedrock of the future relationship economically of what is the UK asking for and what would the EU be prepared to give. And the EU, I suppose briefly, the UK government, and I think the chief negotiator as well as the prime minister have thought that if the EU leaders came under pressure from the UK and they seriously believed we might walk out of these negotiations, and, and and prefer to go to no deal. I think the UK government's calculation has been that the EU side would eventually weaken or soften its provisions on these so-called level playing field issues, which include state aids. And ultimately, because they wanted a tariff-free, quota-free deal with the UK, would agree very light conditionality. And I'm afraid that's not going to happen. The EU simply will not agree um, very light or no conditionality on the level playing field issues. It will insist, in particular on state aids, on those provisions, having a legal status within a free trade agreement. And if the UK can't abide that, then there'll be no deal. Well, I mean, it's absolutely remarkable that both in the US and in the UK, the Right of center governments who were all about uh, least amount of market intervention are now basically looking at the experience of China and others. And I have sort of pivoted in that direction. I, I find it, you know, deeply ironic. Um, you know, uh, the um, uh, Sarah Ivan, my niece, uh, she is a PhD from Cambridge, and she actually works in the commercialization of tech transfer for Cambridge University. And I, especially having dealt with my um, UK relatives over the years, have never felt that UK was lacking in impetus or incentive for tech excellence. Uh, whether we look at what's happening in the universities or even the private sector, a lot of cutting edge technology that we enjoy all over the world have originated from the UK, even in recent decades, uh, which is why I, I find that this desperation that this, this pivotal trade agreement would have to now live or die on an issue of state aid, uh, kind of remarkable. If it was the case that UK had become like a tech innovation wasteland, I would have understood this. But uh, it, it doesn't, at least to me, doesn't make that much sense. I, well, I very much agree. But obviously, you know, I'm not close to, you know, this government's thinking. And, you know, I'm, I've been closer to successive governments, both Labour and Conservative, which have taken a very different view on state aids. And as you say, I don't think, if you say, which I have some sympathy here with the Johnson and uh, Dominic Cummings argument that Europe's problem has been, how does it grow world-class companies at scale to compete with both Asian and uh, American giants? Uh, yes, I think there are a lot of issues behind uh, the uh, behind that in the European Union, uh, taxation frameworks, uh, treatment of venture capital, all kinds of issues, you know, the depth of our capital markets, all kinds of issues which you could genuinely look at to say, where has Europe failed and why is it failing? But this idea that it's failing because we're unable to subsidise heavily enough um, at specific stages and we're unable to subsidise national champions – this does not really remind me of, you know, UK conservative thinking. It reminds me of French mercantilist thinking of about 20 or 25 years ago. So it is quite remarkable. Um, and when you ask the kind of Eurosceptics who are behind this, who genuinely believe this stuff, what do they think they're prevented from doing by the kinds of rules with which the European Union would be perfectly happy to see them operate? You don't really get a very clear answer. So that has always made me wonder whether it is essentially a political and sovereignist argument. And, you know, this has nothing to do with you. We are sovereign. We are autonomous. We are free. Please, you know, this is nothing to do with the trade deal. Or whether it's a deliberate attempt essentially to break down the negotiations and then blame the European Union for them having broken down. 
that would be a bad end to this. This is a dangerous situation for the world. If we end with no deal, it will get very acrimonious between the two parties because obviously Johnson, you can see that with this internal market bill that he's tabled in the last 10 days, Johnson is preparing the ground whereby he can blame the, the European Union for its bad faith and appalling behaviour in the negotiations. If the negotiations break down, you know, he will do much more of that towards the end of the year and say, all I ever wanted was a very skinny Canadian style free trade agreement. But the EU is determined not to give me that, determined to humiliate this country, turn us into a client state of the European Union, etc. But if he goes that route, I mean, the, the reaction will be equally acrimonious from the European side, which will say the British have never at any stage been honest with themselves and with the public about the real implications of leaving a single market in a customs union. It's not our fault. We've negotiated in good faith. It's been the Brits in bad faith. So this is why this is a very delicate, quite dangerous moment in, uh, you know, in this a very dangerous moment, I think, in this negotiation, because if it goes badly, it will get very poisonous between the two sides. And that will be quite difficult to control when we get to the year end. You, all of us, of course, globally are facing a much bigger crisis and a massive economic crisis, uh, both in the, the Eurozone and in the UK economy over COVID-19. But we could have a massive trade and wider geostrategic flare up if these negotiations collapse in the next six to eight weeks, which would obviously be a very bad moment um, in the context of, a, you know, of the world economic conditions we face this winter. Absolutely. And this is why, I mean, sitting here in, in the markets, we are seeing the pound certainly pricing in a uh, in manifestation of those risks. So, Ivan, mean, you have been prescient about this, uh, going way back to 16, 17, 18, you've written and spoken eloquently about the folly of uh, these sort of gamesmanship. Um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about your 2018 speech, uh, Nine Lessons, but before that, uh, could you share with us your experience during the Brexit negotiations back in 16? Sure, very happy to. I mean, I'm um, an, an old stager in international negotiations, both G8 uh, ones, which I, you know, hosted under the UK's last G8 presidency, um, uh, G20 ones, uh, where I was the UK's G20 Sherpa and EU ones. So I've got a lot of uh, negotiating experience. Just to go back to the negotiations which David Cameron led, and I was one of the chief negotiators in those, when he was trying to um, redefine the terms of Britain's European Union membership before we had the in-out referendum that he had decided to call if the Conservatives won uh, an election victory in 2015. That was a difficult and tortuous negotiation. Of course, most of the Europeans didn't really want the negotiation in the first place and thought it was pointless. They thought that the UK already had a special deal and special status within the European Union because we have an opt-out from joining monetary union, because we're not in Schengen, we had multiple different opt-outs on the justice and home affairs dossiers. And here was Cameron coming in and saying, we need to make uh, what's already a special arrangement for the British even more special and even more permanent and change the treaties in order to deliver it. So, I mean, look, I mean, uh, I enjoyed very much doing it and working for him and working in Brussels as the UK's permanent representative. But it was extremely hard going because people thought we are being put through an exercise by the British to deliver an even more special status when they already have a very special status. So the context was difficult. Cameron was and is a, a genuine Eurosceptic, considerably more Eurosceptic, say, than John Major back in the uh, 1990s. And the Conservative Party has moved progressively more Eurosceptic over the last 25 years. I've seen that through my career. Cameron nevertheless fundamentally believed that the UK's interests were best served by remaining in the single market and the, and the customs union, but he didn't want to be part of any political integration, fiscal integration or monetary integration. Now, as I say, others were saying to him and to me, but you're not part of monetary integration because you've got your opt out. Um, it goes without saying that on fiscal integration for the Eurozone, you know, you're insulated from that, so you won't bear the fiscal liabilities that belong to the Eurozone. There, there were always tensions on that question. And then, of course, it became difficult where there is a sort of borderline between the single market and the monetary union, particularly over issues like financial services and financial stability. In other words, were there things that the eurozone players wanted and needed to do to try and shore up the eurozone in the crisis that we had in 2011-12 in particular to try and save the eurozone? 
were there things they were going to do in policy terms that were going to make life very difficult for those of us outside the monetary union, but still inside the single market. So that was where the tension was. There was then also a tension over immigration policy and so-called free movement of people. And that became the neuralgic issue, really, on which I would say Cameron lost the referendum. And that issue was the UK had always been rather relaxed, really, about taking in very large numbers of Central and Eastern Europeans at the point that they joined the European Union. We have a more liberal and more open labour market and very large numbers of Poles and Czechs and Hungarians and others came to the UK. About a million Poles came to the UK within the space of the first few years after the Poles joined the European Union. Why? Because the UK labour market is much easier to get into and to join and to find work in, in London and beyond London. Uh, than other parts of the European Union. We made a merit of that through much of my professional life inside the system. But there's no question that became much more difficult after the financial crisis hit us in 2007, 2008, because then you start to see you know, the spending uh, cuts, the austerity programme, the cuts to public services, and the public starts to associate mass immigration, both from within the European Union and beyond it, with um, uh, austerity and a worsening of public services. And I, if, you, if you look at the origins of why this crisis blew up on Cameron's watch, I mean, it had been coming for a very long time, in my view, as I say, partly because we were in a different category of EU membership from any other uh, player amongst the 28. What Cameron was trying to do, genuinely trying to do, was to construct, I think, a sort of two-tier, a permanent two-tier or multi-tier Europe where the UK could remain happily in the single market and the customs union, but absent itself from all other political uh, integration projects that it didn't want to join. And that was a very uneasy thing to try and do. I think he was in good faith trying to do it. I was obviously trying to then negotiate texts which gave that sufficient substance that he felt he could sell that to the country. But when he came to sell it to the country, as I say, the big issue was immigration and free movement of people. And he essentially lost that to the Eurosceptics who were able to persuade the public that immigration, both from within the European Union and outside it, was out of control. And in the end, he had a very unenthusiastic message for the public, in a way deliberately, because as I say, he was a Eurosceptic about, you know, I agree with you that I don't much like the European institutions and the process of European integration, but what I'm delivering you is the best, or the best of both worlds. We remain inside the outer perimeter wall of the, uh, of the market, and that's where we want to be, but we insulate ourselves from everything else that the Europeans, uh, the other Europeans want to do. And that's quite a difficult message to sell to the general public. You're basically saying, well, a lot of this organization and a lot of its purposes are a bit lousy, but I'm going to keep you in the two or three purposes that are really worth having. And we'll live in our own universe inside the European Union, but not really belonging to the bulk of the projects that the rest of them want to persist. With. So it didn't, I, you know, I was famously before the referendum, the most gloomy person inside the system as to whether the referendum, an in-out referendum was winnable. Referendums are very difficult to win in these circumstances because the public doesn't necessarily understand fully the question, which is no criticism of the public. Why should they understand all the kinds of things that you know insiders understand about the technical details of being in a single market? So they answer the question they want to answer, and they wanted to give the establishment of this country a good kicking, I think, particularly after the, the very dire effects of the financial crisis and of austerity uh, politics on public expenditure, you know, in the in the years after the financial crisis. So I don't think it was at all surprising that Cameron's attempt to keep us in, but on revised terms, failed. The difficulty, and we've been suffering from it ever since, is the biggest proponents of Brexit, and they did include Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others who are very prominent in the current cabinet, were never very clear about what the destination was um, after we left. And they were very cavalier about how easy it was going to be to extricate ourselves from everything in the European Union that we didn't like. But they kept telling the public that you would still get com basically completely unchanged free, tr tr free trade terms, you know, the same levels of market access. Nothing would change in the real world on the things that we liked about the European Union. We would just take ourselves out of the political and juridical structures. 
Well, that was never going to be true. Uh, it could never be true. The EU, as a 27, was never going to say to the Brits, oh, well, don't worry. Essentially, uh, virtually everything you like about European Union membership can carry on unchanged, despite the fact that you're no longer a member. Uh, you don't need to contribute vast sums to the EU budget. You don't need to respect all the legal obligations you used to when you were a member, but you can have market access on the same terms. I mean, by definition, I mean, the club, if the club had negotiated like that uh, against the UK, it would have disintegrated by now. And so that was the fundamental problem I knew I was facing immediately after the, the referendum when we uh, started the withdrawal negotiations. You knew that the other side had no reason to make this process easy want to dictate the sequencing and the process to drive their own interests. Their own interests are the integrity and survival of their project and demonstrating it's better to be inside the project than outside the project. And so without being too unpleasant on it, they need Brexit not to go well for the British. They need it to be difficult and unpleasant and for it to be visible to the British public and other publics that there are major downsides from the Brexit process. So we were always facing, you know, I think back on this virtually every day of my life, as you can imagine, because it was a, a highly intense experience um, uh, being one of the chief negotiators, you know, both for, before the referendum and afterwards. And you think it's extremely difficult to contrive a, a sensible, reasonably economically rational, amicable process when the interests of both parties are as divergent as this and where um, the Brexiteers were, were delivering to the public fantasies about what would be available after Brexit, which you privately knew they couldn't conceivably deliver because they wouldn't be able to negotiate. That's right. Um, so that was 2016. Then by 2017, you left that job. And yep. in 2018, you had sort of taken stock of all the lessons of Brexit. And I think it was at the University of Liverpool in late 2018, you gave the famous nine lessons from Brexit speech. Um, in that speech, which I think was absolutely seminal, you went through issues like Brexit being a process and not an event, what sovereignty meant in this context, the point of maintaining preferential trade relationship with the EU, how the nature of negotiation impacts the democratic process. So it's been about 20 months since then. Uh, which of those lessons have been heeded and which lessons are crying out for follow through? Well, I'm sad to say, although, um, you know, I, I was pleased with the lecture and pleased with the book it turned into. And I think a lot of it still applies and a lot of those lessons do need to be learned. Um, there's not much evidence that the British political class um, has managed honestly to face the trade-offs and you're seeing it now. For example, the thing um, that's popped up this week as the so-called blockade of UK um, agricultural goods in, uh, being exported into uh, Southern Ireland and the rest of the EU market. What's that actually about? It's about one of my nine lessons. The, the UK is saying we will still have the same sanitary and phytosanitary regulations as the EU on the day after the transition period ends, namely 1st of January 2021. So you know that we're in full alignment with your system on the day after. So we demand the same market access and to be able to export our agricultural produce on the same terms as when we were a member. And the EU says, and I basically predicted they would say this on many issues in my book, we're not interested in what your arrangement is going to be on day one after exit. We want to know where you want to be on day two and day 200 and day 2000. You must have left the European Union in order to want to do something different. Otherwise, why would you leave it? So could we see now in, in detail, in print, please, the details of your future sanitary and phytosanitary regime? And then we'll judge um, you know, how close that is to ours. Um, and uh, and then accord you the uh, the right level of market access on that basis. But please don't fob us off telling us that on day one we're still compliant with your rules because we knew you were going to be compliant then. We want to know where you want to be in a few years' time and why you want to be there. Now, between ourselves, of course, they also know that the Americans are putting the UK under great pressure to change their SPS rules more in an American direction uh, than in a European direction. And the government keeps on sort of denying that there are these trade-offs. You know, there are, uh, 
we all know that's going on. As I say, there's plenty of pressure coming from both from the White House and USTR on British uh, regulations. And that's perfectly legitimate for the Americans to seek as part of a UK US FTA changes to UK regulations. But the government refuses really to acknowledge to the public or explain to the public that there are real tensions here and sooner or later we have to make some choices and if we make some choices which go in a more American direction then we'll lose very substantial market access into the European market. So I mean my fear is I was trying genuinely as somebody who is not a politician, doesn't aspire to be a politician, um, fully accepts the verdict of the British people that we wanted to leave the European Union. I've never been in favour of a second referendum and rerunning the referendum. Um, all I was trying to urge was we desperately need a clear, honest political discussion which exposes to the public the real choices and real trade-offs that there are when you face what version of Brexit do you want to implement. Um, and I'm afraid four and a half years on, we're still in denial about that. or We've still got a political class that wants to avoid telling the public that there are you know, serious downsides, as well as no doubt upsides from Brexit. And we are going to have to work through those issues and come to conclusions. And there will be losers as well as winners. In fact, obviously, in my view, and I think the view of most economic forecasters, certainly for the first five to 10 years, there are going to be more losers than winners. And my fear has always been in a, in a democracy like this. I, after all, why are we doing Brexit? and Why the Brexiteers want it? Because they wanted more democratic control and accountability closer to the people. Fine, that's a very legitimate argument against um, European Union governance, and they could have made more of that. But if that's what you want, then you need a serious democratic debate about what are you going to do with your autonomy and freedom and which choices are you going to make and why are you going to make them? And we're having a very, very dishonest, unsatisfactory debate about that even now. So I fear, uh, I don't think many of the lessons have yet been absorbed or learned. A lot of people, I think, have tried to digest these lessons. A lot of people privately, including quite surprising people, have said to me, you know, you're quite right to say a lot of this stuff and put it in print. And it's, uh, I hope, pretty clear. Uh, so I think a lot of people have cogitated about it. But having a political debate which levels with the public about, you know, what version of Brexit we're really going for and why. Um, we're still a long way off that, I'm afraid. Right. I mean, I, I noticed this during the elections uh, last year that this the notion of just get it over with, just get it done, uh, overtook any sort of desire to appreciate the nuances and the downsides. Uh, and now I think there's even significant greater distraction with COVID-19. Um, yeah. Sir so, Ivan, earlier you were talking about the sense of foreboding that you know this winter could be a challenging one between the pandemic and possible um, you know stumbles along the Brexit process. What's your sense of the UK economy going forward? Well, it's very difficult to judge. Um, uh, we've not had a good COVID crisis so far. Let's be honest. Um, you know the figures are bad um, for uh, mortality, uh, put it candidly, and amongst the worst figures in the European uh, uh, area for that, amongst the worst figures in the world. And uh, you know we let the first outbreak get very badly out of control. We probably locked down too late. There was a lot of confusion about testing and tracing systems. There still is. We're still struggling with our test and trace system. Uh, and there are major concerns, you know, bubbling up even this week uh, about the capability of that system and about the reliability of figures and about the pressures there are going to be on the National Health Service uh, this winter. Now, we're not alone in that. Look at the French figures or Spanish figures, um, uh, let alone what's, get, what's happening in the US. Uh, so we're far from alone in facing this. But I, I think for the... UK government and administration, it's been rather a sobering experience uh, for those people I talk to. And you look at our performance, certainly in comparison, say, with German performance, and it's not been very encouraging about the capability of the British state. Um, on the UK economy, I've always, look, I'm an ex-Treasury person by, by origin, and I've always been relatively optimistic about the UK economy, because I think we have, as you were saying, on you know, technology and innovation, and I was saying on you know, open labour markets um, and entrepreneurship, um, I think we have some comparative advantages over at least many in the European time zone. But... Um, Brexit is a headwind to growth and productivity, let's be honest, over the next five to 10 years. It's very difficult. I mean, I know this is a deeply unpopular thing to say in UK government circles, 
But it isn't just the Treasury saying that pre the referendum in 2016. It's the Office of Budget Responsibility saying that, which is independent of government, saying that in advance of the uh, budget earlier in the year. So there's quite a significant hit to UK GDP over the next 10 to 15 years as a consequence of a hard Brexit, whether there's a skinny free trade deal or not. So we've added to our problems on weak productivity, and our productivity growth has been extraordinarily weak, almost inexplicably weak, over the last 10 years. Uh, our unemployment has been you know, a remarkable success story. Uh, of course, that can be the flip side of the productivity story. Uh, but unemployment had pre-COVID remained at sort of, you know, three and a half to four percent, which is remarkably low by the standards of both the European Union and our own standards in the last 30 years. But there are signs of real weaknesses in, you know, chunks of our economy. And as I say, we're moving into a decade where we're adding headwinds to it. And the public finances have now taken, as they have elsewhere, an enormous buffeting from COVID-19. Um, so um, a huge explosion in the deficit, which was inevitable. Um, uh, and that will have major consequences uh, you know, on long-term debt. I think it's still sustainable. The UK government is obviously still entirely able to finance itself in the markets. And there's confidence, I think, in uh, our fiscal policy, at least at the moment. But very difficult times are coming. We can't we can't deny that as and when COVID goes away, if we if that if that happens, we're probably in this parliament going to face quite substantial tax rises somewhere, and tax rises are difficult for a Conservative government to put through, and there are probably going to have to be quite major spending cuts, even though the government says it will not return to the austerity politics of David Cameron, George Osborne, and the coalition government after the financial crisis. Well, they can say that till they're blue in the face, but we actually know that sooner or later, quite substantial tax rises and quite sub substantial spending cuts are going to be necessary to restore the public finances to virtue in 2023 to 24, 25. So I think we've got a very difficult time ahead. It's very difficult for any Chancellor of the Exchequer. I mean, Rishi Sunak is obviously a, a, a talented guy, a new, young, uh, clever Chancellor. You're operating you know, first of all, in the dark on Brexit, which is uh, at the moment looking relatively minor at year end in comparison with COVID, but you don't know whether you're facing a no deal Brexit or a uh, skinny free trade deal Brexit. And we might not know that for the next six to eight weeks. And he's got a budget coming up in November. And we don't know whether we're going to get a, you know, a severe second wave or, or of COVID. I mean, the signs this week are, are looking highly discouraging and not just here on where this is going. And there are already, you know, more severe local lockdowns. This has obviously had a massive impact in Q2 on suppressing economic activity. We've bounced back quite fast, at least in, uh, in the consumer space. Um, and there have been some encouraging signs in Q3, but we're nowhere near back to where we were before COVID broke out. And then you've got this issue of, you know, how sustainable is this in the national health service system? And is the system under immense strain? Um, and would it be able to survive a really massive second wave, particularly if we had a difficult winter and, you know, accompanying flus and whatever? So... I think it's quite difficult for any of us to be too optimistic in any part of the world about uh, about the state of things uh, in uh, on COVID-19. And it's quite, you know, until we get uh, a vaccine or vaccines that work, it's going to be a bumpy period in the world economy. The UK economy has some specific strengths. My concern has always been with Brexit that you throw away some of those strengths and you make life much more difficult for chunks of manufacturing and services. We basically deliver very little, if nothing, on services in our largest market, which is the EU market. So we're definitely making life much more difficult for highly competitive UK services companies. That's not just financial services, that's you know legal and consulting and accountancy and all ancillary services that are bundled in with goods. And then in the goods sectors, you know, if you leave a single market in a customs union and, uh, you know, even if you end up with a skinny FTA, it's going to be very difficult for the auto sector, difficult for pharmaceuticals and chemicals, uh, difficult for the aviation sector, which is in enough trouble anyway. There are specific chunks of, you know, kind of old style manufacturing that are going to be really rather badly hit by, uh, by a hard Brexit, where you see the 
likelihood of considerable job losses and the likelihood of a transfer of activity away from the UK into uh, other parts of Europe. So I think it's difficult, you know. I mean, I, I don't want to sound a bloomster and a doomster, and you always get labelled as that, uh, you know, by by this government in this country if you say it, that any aspect of Brexit is anything other than the sunlit uplands. And I'm not saying there aren't. Of course, there are advantages to being, you know, sovereign and autonomous and running your own jurisdiction and having your own rules, and there certainly will be in areas like financial services. But let's not kid ourselves. I mean, we're taking a very, very difficult step, and for significant areas of the economy, we're creating operating conditions which will be tougher than their European competitors will have to face over the next three to five years. Absolutely. And also, I think the critical issue, and you mentioned this about the um, uh, way uh, uh, Prime Minister Cameron had approached it, that that was with good faith. If the view is that, you know, the negotiations are being done on bad faith, uh, there's so much to lose. I've been reading about uh, the Euroclear issue, which will be extended yeah. all the way for a couple of more years. Uh, but sooner or later, Europeans would want to bring that back to mainland. And I'm sure that timetable can be hastened if other issues around trade negotiations, you know, fall into acrimonious, bad faith uh, bickering. Um, I, and I also think that, you know, instead of being gloomy, I think what you are doing uh, very eloquently is sort of underscoring the stakes involved, uh, that this is not something that can be solved in a matter of uh, days. Uh, it's, it's challenging and one needs to approach this with a great deal of gravity. Uh, and, and politicians are doing a disservice to their population by not uh, explaining how grave matters are. I fear that's right. The trust issue, the trust issue does worry me because, look, it was always going to be difficult, as I say, because our fundamental interests about whether Brexit is a success or whether it's a failure uh, do diverge. And the negotiating interests of the EU are, are not to make this an easy process. And uh, Brexiteer government ministers uh, are not really keen on the Eurozone or the European Union and are convinced that it's a failing project. So the two sides start a long way apart and it's difficult to construct an amicable trust work, trusting environment. But you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, and I know as a negotiator, you can't get anywhere in a negotiation unless between the key principles who are negotiating, there is a reasonably high, in fact, pro often very high level of personal trust that somebody is good to stick to their word and that deals are deals and will be adhered to. And the difficulty with the message the UK government has sent on its behaviour in the last 10 days on the withdrawal agreement, because that is a clear breach of international law. There's no, there's no doubt of that. And even if they accept the amendment from some backbenchers next week, uh, the so-called Neil Amendment, um, they're still in breach of international law. That sent a very strong message. You, you commented earlier on Nancy Pelosi having picked it up. Joe Biden has picked it up and tweeted on it in the last 24 hours. That sent a very difficult message inside the European Union and beyond it of, is the UK government good for its word? Will it stick to agreements that it's formally signed and ratified and indeed, as I say, uh, glorified as a great British negotiating triumph, but now wants to reopen the text or scupper bits of the text, or be able domestically to override bits of the text because they discover they really don't like the implications. Now, that's quite a dangerous thing to do in a negotiation. If you if you send the other side an indication that, you know, even when they have nailed down a text and you've agreed it and ratified it in your parliament, you might choose to reopen it or tr choose to find domestic ways to override it. That's a very dangerous signal to send. I think it has global implications as well on the trustworthiness of the UK, but also what we are saying and want to say and should be saying about the rule of law elsewhere in the world. I th I'm afraid people will look at that and say, well, actually, that's how the British government has behaved. Sir Ivan, unfortunately, this is a threat that we see extend from the UK to the US. Uh, in the last three years, we've seen the Trump administration also walk away from multilateral approaches to a rules-based order. Uh, and, and that even if uh, you know, the, the scene were to change and Biden were to be the president, I think some of the damage that has happened, even with respect to the US, as far as negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership or issues related to WTO are concerned. Same issue. So I want you to, in the final part of our discussion, um, pontificate a little bit. Uh, US and UK. Uh, with the Republican Party and the Conservative Party, are they moving in the same direction, this sort of skepticism toward rules-based order and obsession with bilateralism? 
Well, it's a great question. It's quite a difficult one to answer. I mean, there are obviously similarities in method between uh, Johnson and, and Trump. Um, and I think Johnson does look at Trump and learn from him on uh, domestic methodology. And as a negotiator, he likes taking the people by surprise and he likes destabilizing uh, the other side and doing it deliberately. So that has Trumpian uh, overtones. He's obviously a very different a different character and a very British kind of character as opposed to Trump. So they're not they're not a, they're not totally alike in terms of personality, but there's something in it. The oddity with this this government, um, and I say it including of convinced, um, avid, uh, first generation sort of Brexiteers like Liam Fox, who wants to be, after all, now Director General of the uh, World Trade Organization. Um, I don't think it's a very very likely uh, candidacy, but this is not a man who wants to tear down the rules-based multilateral order. In, in fact, uh, you know, he's applying to be WTO DG in order to run a bit of it. Um, if you talk to the key Brexiteers, you know, and I obviously did a lot when in government, um, uh, you know, in various jobs, um, they talk quite a good game about still adhering to a rules-based international order and being genuine multilateralists, um, as well as wanting an active and genuinely liberal and free trading trade policy. And they're often very critical of the European Union for not being free trading enough. So that, in a sense, is encouraging. These people don't start off with a desire, I think, to be protectionist. The question is, are they, you know, are they good for those commitments and do they really understand what you know how you can progress on free trade both multilaterally and regionally and bilaterally in the modern world and i'm not sure they do and the most difficult discussion was always on the services side where after all it's been very difficult to make a huge amount of progress multilaterally for obvious reasons um and you might be able to make some progress within the WTO plurilaterally, and I would hope the UK would be in favour of that. But obviously, you can go further on the liberalisation of services across borders within regional blocks. That's what the single market was all about. The UK used to be the biggest enthusiast for driving that on services liberalisation internally. And it's pretty hard to make big progress on services liberalisation simply via bilateral FTAs. So I'm not sure they ever fully under, and we are a very competitive services economy with a rather small industrial sector. I mean, some very competitive industrial firms in our in bits of our industrial sectors, but we're a very services heavy economy and we've been very competitive in services, but much our biggest export market, we've just made life much more difficult for and much more difficult in for our own competitive services firms. So there's an incoherence, I think, about this. It's not, I think, that they start, and after all, if you're the superpower, which the Americans are, you can either ignore the multilateral order or, or tear it up. Um, I think it's a very dangerous thing to do. And the current US administration's approach in the WTO and elsewhere worries me because they're commitment to multilateralism is, uh, to put it kindly, wafer thin, I think, um, they can get away with that because they're the superpower and because they've got the gunboats, essentially. Um, any superpower could, and the UK was a superpower in the early 19th century and could no doubt do the same whilst talking bold talk about its free trade principles. Um, you can't do that as a modest um, but hopefully serious second-ranking power in the way that the UK is. So I think we, look, I think this will work itself out over time. I don't think the UK is going to decline into being completely mercantilist and protectionist. I am worried by some of the trends that you see um, on the kind of migration debate and the closure of borders debate and on some of what we discussed earlier on industrial policy and seemingly having a deliberate preference for national firms and national champions and going down a route which I always thought was rather intellectually bankrupt. So there are mixed signs, but I suppose after a revolution, and I've described this in one or two other lectures as a revolution, it's a revolution led by a part of the elite against another part of the elite. It's not a revolution from below, but Brexit is a revolution in the way we govern ourselves. Whether you, whether you like the revolution or not, it's a revolutionary moment and it's been a revolutionary movement. Revolutions, you know, to, tend to develop a momentum of their own. And the authors of the revolution can sometimes be deeply disappointed where, by where the revolution ends up. 
And it's obviously very difficult for somebody like me, who's you know an old lag and an old stager and been around the block a, a lot on trade policy, you know, both within the European Union and with the Americans and with Chinese accession to the WTO and lots of other things over the last 25 years. Um, it's difficult to take it from me. But you know, you've got to be a bit careful what you wish for when you unleash a revolution of the sort that the Brexiteers have wished for. And they may discover they've lost control of their own revolution. And whilst they started by wanting it to be you know, liberal and open and globalist and free trading, it may end up anything but. And I think all of this is, all of this is in play in the next um, you know, decade or more. These are the Americans. Look, uh, the British have always looked at least as much to the Americans, if not more, and no doubt to others in the Anglo-Saxon community as we have to the European continent. I'm not, I'm not against that. It's just a statement of fact over you know, two or three hundred years, maybe 500 years. We've always had a sort of maritime and global uh, experience, uh, as well as a kind of European continental experience. So we've always looked both ways. We do look at American politics at least as closely um, as at European politics. Personally, but this is just a personal reflection, I find it disturbing the extent to which uh, the Republican grandees and the, it, it, the Republican Party has gone along with um, uh, Trumpism, even though many of these uh, people professed strongly to believe in something which isn't remotely close to what Trump has done over the last four years. And, you know, I find that rather depressing to watch with the honourable exceptions of the, you know, the John McCain's and Mitt Romney's. Not too many have stood out against the way in which the Republican Party's supposed uh, ideology has been subverted really over the last four to five years. With Johnson, I think that's a bit more complex in the Conservative Party. There are lots of different strands still in the Conservative Party. I don't think there's such a thing as Johnsonism yet. Um, even uh, people who went along with him and promoted him and voted for him as party leader in order to get rid of Theresa May um, are, I think, a bit anxious about some of the trends they're seeing in the last nine months in office. They're worried about the incompetence that they're seeing from this number 10. They're worried about the kind of Cummings effect. They're worried about the control, the control freakery that is coming uh, from number 10. But all, this combination of heavy control from the centre of government, but no great evidence of competence in delivering the goals of government. So I think it's too early to judge on Johnson. He's obviously been much, he's not been there anything like as long as Trump. But his position is not as secure as it was even a few months ago. I mean, obviously, the poor man had a very, uh, a very bad uh, attack of COVID. And we all know he was in hospital and his life was in, in danger. One never knows the extent to which he's you know, fully recovered from that. I worked for him only uh, relatively briefly as foreign secretary. Look, we all know this is an intelligent, uh, smart, uh, witty uh, guy with, you know, very good use of rhetoric. He's not a man who does a huge amount of detail and substance and a huge amount of reading of, of complex papers um, and not a man who does, you know, complex policy positions. And the difficulty for him is he's taken office at a time when very deep reflection is needed, serious reflection is needed on where is the UK going and why is it going there and what is our strategy and what is the direction of our both our domestic policy and our foreign policy. And it seems to me currently really rather a weak government in being able to think these things through in any depth and reach a coherent, consistent position. Well, um, on that somber but highly insightful note, Sir Ivan Rogers, I thank you very, very much for your time. Not at all. Really delighted to do it. It was great. Uh, I'd like to also thank our listeners. Uh, Kopi Time was produced by Martin Tucky. It's for information only and does not represent any trade recommendation. All 29 episodes of our podcast are available on YouTube and all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.